Hello and welcome to episode one of the Higher Grounds, a vlog for anyone interested in deep questions, first principles, and a leisurely pursuit of true philosophy. I'm Jake Whalen, and today we're going to debunk the unmoved mover debunked. Rationality Rules is a YouTube channel that I recently discovered, run by Mr. Stephen Woodford, and it's devoted to debunking religious and supernatural arguments with slick videos that calmly explain the unreasonableness of many claims about science, culture, and philosophy. And one thing that I like about Mr. Woodford's videos is how he parses an opposing argument into the raw premises and tries to succinctly explain where there's a breakdown in the reasoning of the arguments. And these days, when it seems that rational discourse between people who disagree is all but lost, the format of looking into the premises of an argument and addressing the reasoning is a welcome respite. Uh, however, while I applaud Mr. Woodford for his initiative to call for right reasoning, the misconceptions and logical errors he exhibits in his videos uh, make it abundantly clear that as a philosopher and logician, he still has a ways to go. And this is very plain to see in one of his most recent videos, Ben Shapiro Calmly Educated by Stephen Woodford. And in it, Mr. Woodford proposes to debunk Aquinas' unmoved mover, but unfortunately, all he really does is show his inability, or maybe unwillingness, uh, to take Aquinas' position seriously. He repeatedly mischaracterizes the justification for Aquinas' premises, and even at times commits the very fallacies of which he wrongfully accuses Aquinas. While it's not clear if these objections to the first way spring from honest ignorance or willful reluctance to study the arguments on their own terms, either way, as a lover of wisdom, I can't let such unfounded criticisms pass unchallenged. Now, I've noticed for a while that when it comes to arguments for the existence of God, Ben Shapiro seems to be in favor of a return to Aristotle and St. Thomas, which is a good thing. It's great to see someone with such a wide audience spreading those arguments to more people. Mr. Woodford is not a fan of those arguments, however. He implies that they are not really worth his time. In fact, the reason I haven't addressed his religious arguments before is because I consider them low-hanging fruit. I guess Mr. Woodford has run out of subject material if he now has to contend himself with such facile controversies. In any case, he proceeds to list the two main arguments that Ben is wont to give, the argument from sufficient reason and the argument of the unmoved mover, and it's the latter which Mr. Woodford proposes to address in his video, leaving the former for a subsequent one. And based on his analysis of this argument, you can judge if the next one will be worth considering. Now, Mr. Woodford prefaces his refutation with a clip of Shapiro quickly summarizing Aquinas' argument during some Young American Foundation Q&A, which is followed by some clips of Shapiro's interview with Edward Fazer, who also gives a brief sketch of the argument. Now, Woodford's first problem with the Fazer rendition is with the number of premises, and it sounds as if he thinks that that is a strike against it. Now, Fazer's rendition of this argument is composed of 49 premises. Yeah, I'm serious, 49. Now this point is surprising for a couple of reasons. At first I thought, wow, this guy pulled 49 premises from that interview with Shapiro? That's really hard to do. But when I picked up a copy of Five Proofs for the Existence of God, I found that Phaser has them already laid out and numbered on page 37. So I guess listing the number of premises was not the mark of acumen that I originally thought. Uh, second, this is a little misleading at best. Mr. Woodford doesn't even mention that Phaser's 49 premises are there to prove not just the existence of God, but also some of the divine attributes outside of time, pure act, etc. Woodford is well aware of this since later on he says, now, To be fair, Ben evidently offers additional arguments as to why he attributes such qualities to this unactualized actualizer, and Phaser spends premises 19 to 49 doing the same. But these are really additional arguments. And so, so again, the 49 premises are there to prove more than simply God exists, so we shouldn't be surprised that Aquinas has fewer premises. And finally, instead of applauding what is clearly an effort to argue syllogistically from first principles, Mr. Woodford tries to use the number of premises as a reason to dispute Phaser's argument. Quoting John Adams, he says, Mystery, and in this case a billion premises, is a convenient excuse for absurdity. I find it highly doubtful that if pressed, Mr. Woodford would find this a strike against any argument related to the empirical sciences. Isaac Newton spent over 90 propositions proving his law of universal gravitation, and Einstein's relativity, the special and general theory, is about 200 pages long. It would be interesting to see how many premises are required to syllogistically argue to the existence of dark energy apparently Mr. Woodford's counterexample for everything. Rigorous justification is demanded in the modern sciences, so why would we expect anything less in matters of philosophy? Now, I appreciate 
Mr. Woodford's efforts to show how honestly he's assessing the argument of St. Thomas with a barrage of clips of people explaining the same argument. And this wouldn't be a problem, except that, as we will see, Mr. Woodford is going to take issue with some of the ways Shapiro and Fazer state their premises and point to them as unfounded or fallacious. He doesn't make any allowances for the fact that they're in an interview setting and the compactness that that requires. Woodford obviously listens to these exchanges closely. Did he not hear Shapiro say, And I'm going to try and boil this down so that it makes some sense. This tacit and I think unfair implication that these brief informal conversations are representing the arguments in all their completeness is characteristic of Rationality Rules videos. For example, in his video Thomas Aquinas' Unmoved Mover Debunked, Woodford makes the bold claim of refuting St. Thomas, even putting a dunce hat on him, and then proceeds to criticize a modern scholar's brief summary of him. Does he honestly think that this is a fair way of analyzing the thought of St. Thomas? If Woodford wants to run with the big dogs, then he should address what Aquinas said, not what someone else said about what Aquinas said. Mr. Woodford elects to bypass Shapiro and Fazer's renderings of the argument and focus on Aquinas. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. First, Shapiro and Fazer point to Aquinas as the original source for their approach to the question of theism, so Woodford may be trying to get three birds with one stone here. Second, it may be that Woodford has noticed the tendency in his videos I just mentioned of claiming he's going to refute a position of a major philosopher and then proceed to adjudicate over a contemporary popularizer's rendition of the argument, and he's trying to remedy it. If so, good for him. Then again, it may be that he just does not want to bother with the billion premises of Fazer's version. But in any case, Woodford decides to present the first way, put very succinctly by Aquinas in question 2, article 3 of the first part of the Summa. And I hope this is a signal that in the future, Woodford will break from his usual pattern and deal with the original source. Now, as he gears up to take down the argument, Woodford anticipates that he will be accused of not understanding the argument. A lot of the objections that were trotted out, I realized, were aimed at caricatures. They were aimed at straw men. They weren't really attacking what Aquinas or Leibniz or whoever had actually said. On this note, the esteemed biologist Jerry Coyne wrote an excellent rebuttal to Phaser and correctly predicted his reply by writing, His response will consist in noting my failure to have spent half my lifetime studying the works of Aquinas and Phaser. That's like saying, I know what you're going to say, but since I know you're going to say it, therefore it's invalid. That's not an argument. Further, Woodford is doing a little bait and switch when he equates the accusation that you do not understand the argument with you have not spent half your lifetime studying the works of Aquinas. Fazer's response was not that. It sounds more like he was saying, if you understand the argument, show me and stop addressing these caricatures of the argument. If you want to understand them, study those things however long it takes you. If you have an open mind, you may find that it doesn't take half your life, though it will take some work. But if you're not open to understanding what Thomas taught, it may never happen. Now, as the video progresses, so does Woodford's carelessness. It's a, what I call in the book, a purely actual actualizer or an unchanging changer or an unmoving mover. Or an uncaused cause or a non-contingent contingency, etc. It's pretty much all the same. Those are not pretty much the same. Phaser lists things that are all based on the Aristotelian definition of motion. The whole argument is based on motion. Woodford jumps in and equates this with a different order of dependency, efficient causality, which belongs to Thomas's second way, not his first way. And he groups these things together again later in the video. No, that we must assume an unactualized actualizer, or a first cause, or an unmoved mover, or a non-contingent contingency. Where did this non-contingent contingency idea come from? It's not in St. Thomas probably for the very good reason that it's just a blatant contradiction. Something can't be non-contingent and contingent at the same time in the same respect. Now, if Phaser had said a non-moving moving thing or an unmoved moved thing, then Woodford may have a point and his juxtaposition with non-contingent contingency would make sense. But equating this idea of non-contingent contingency with the unmoved mover shows that Mr. Woodford just doesn't have the precision in his words or concepts necessary for talking about matters of philosophy. And it's this kind of oversight that gets Mr. Woodford in trouble. But he's determined to show that Aquinas is wrong. So the objections begin. The first premise, some things are in motion, is so obvious that even Woodford can't doubt it. But he quickly points out a devastating flaw, supposedly, in the second premise. Anything in motion is moved by another. But since we've only observed a tiny fragment of the universe, we can't honestly assert that everything adheres to the principle of causation, lest we want to commit a black swan fallacy. First of all, 
Aquinas is not saying that everything adheres to the principle of causation, but only those things brought from potency to act. Second, while it's true that this premise requires some work to establish, to assume that it's simply a generalization of many particulars is a complete straw man. Certainly during their interviews, Fazer and Shapiro try to manifest this premise with concrete examples from common experience, but it would be premature to say that these are the proofs for the universality of that premise. Now, in the scholastic tradition, a beginner in theology would have already studied natural philosophy and metaphysics thoroughly, including the doctrine of Aristotle's physics. The philosopher argues there that since motion is the act of the potential insofar as it is potential, and this is a very precise definition Aquinas has in mind, if that definition is right, then it follows that whatever is in motion is moved by another. You can't give what you don't have, as the saying goes, and therefore, the actualization of a potential will require the power of something that is actual in that respect. Thus, a cold cup of coffee, to use Phaser's favorite example, will require something actually, or virtually, hot in order to warm it up. Now, of course, much more could be said about the second premise, and to explore it fully would require a separate video, but Aquinas seems to be of a similar mind. It is called the Summa Theologiae, which means summary of theology. And so it has been traditionally understood that he's assuming his readers are already familiar with the metaphysical framework and vocabulary of the scholastics. Now, of course, this may be assuming too much in Mr. Woodford's case. Now, if Mr. Woodford were right in supposing that Aquinas' second premise was a general statement based on many particular instances, then he would certainly have a point. Sentences like, all swans are white, or all life is carbon-based, are such statements, and therefore are only probably true. But this is not so for all universal statements. All swans are animals, all bachelors are unmarried, are universally true, and one does not need to check every single instance to verify them. These statements are deduced from definitions. They're not inductions or generalizations, which makes them not just probably true, but universally true. In a similar way, Whatever is in motion is moved by another, it's a deduction from the definition of motion and is therefore as certain as the fact that all triangles have three sides. Now this is just a brief sketch of the nature of certainty in universal statements, but it's enough to resolve Mr. Woodford's objection, which refutes nothing but a straw man. Next, Mr. Woodford makes a preemptive reference to a corollary in the first way, that the unmoved mover must be pure act, and he posits that this contradicts the second premise anything in motion is moved by another. He says, The proponents of Aquinas' unmoved mover don't accept this premise, even tentatively. While they insist that whenever something goes from potential to actual, there's always something already actual that makes that happen. They make a special exception, or commit a special pleading fallacy, for their God. They insist that their God had the potential to create the universe, that it then actually created the universe, but that it did so without something actualizing. Whoever these proponents are, they're certainly not Shapiro, Fazer, or Aquinas. I gotta wonder how carefully Mr. Woodford studied Fazer's version of the argument, especially premises 15 to 23, which demonstrate that a first mover is purely actual and outside of time. But despite this resource, Mr. Woodford appears to be mired in his own imagination, picturing a, a superpowered being somehow existing before the universe but still subject to time, who was waiting around for all eternity and then decided one day to create the universe. The only problem is, such a view of God is entirely absent from Aquinas' teaching. Were any theist to posit such a notion, Aquinas and Phaser would object right alongside Mr. Woodford, because, as Mr. Woodford rightly points out, claiming that such a God is also pure act would certainly be a case of special pleading. But this objection only applies to Mr. Woodford's anthropomorphized conception of God, not Aquinas' concept of an unmoved mover. Now, incredibly, Mr. Woodford seems to be somewhat aware of this distinction, but he persists in his failure to see how it resolves anything. Either this, or they insist that their god doesn't have any potential to be actualized, but in which case, it follows, according to their logic, that it cannot actualize anything, because... On analysis, change always involves the actualization of a potential. This apparent absurdity only arises because Mr. Woodford mistakenly extends Phaser's statement to include not only the changed thing, but also the changer. As we discussed before, the definition of motion, or change as Phaser refers to it, requires a changer that is actual with respect to the change. However, this actuality of the changer is independent of the changed thing, just as a piano teacher actually knows how to play even as the student goes from potentially knowing to actually knowing how to play. Such is the case with something purely actual, like an unmoved mover. 
Now, Mr. Phaser knows this, and his only claim was that change always involves the actualization of the potential on the part of the changing thing. This objection turns out to be just another case in point of Phaser's lament about the new atheists rejecting straw men, a lament that sadly falls on deaf ears in the case of Mr. Woodford. And so, Mr. Woodford moves on to deal with what he considers to be premise three. Now, there's a fair amount of confusion around this premise. Indeed. Indeed, and if there is, Mr. Woodford's logical analysis skills are probably causing some of it. He doesn't even split up the article into the premises correctly. He highlights several statements, and it's not clear exactly what part of the selection he thinks is the third premise. Does he mean a series of move movers can't go on to infinity? Then why does he spend the next few minutes saying things might be able to move themselves? It sounds like he's objecting to the statement, whatever is in motion must be put in motion by another, but that's what he said the second premise was. And the fact that line 2 says whatever is in motion is put in motion by another, and that line 12 says therefore whatever is in motion is put in motion by another, that should have been a dead giveaway that they were part of the same premise. Are you still confused about this premise? <laughs> still not clear on what it is, Mr. Woodford's impulse is to simply dismiss the elusive premise. And saying, it's generally agreed that it's not needed for the argument. Mr. Woodford omits from whence this general consensus comes, and so it's difficult to see why we should even grant this statement, even if he says it with a British accent. He weakly attempts to justify his abrupt dismissal, which is presumably why proponents, including Ben and Fazer, don't include it. But even if that were true, it doesn't follow that the premise is not required. It could be that Shapiro and Fazer are just abbreviating the argument for the sake of time. Apparently Aquinas thought it was necessary, otherwise he wouldn't have included it. And if Mr. Woodford really proposes to debunk Shapiro and Fazer by refuting Aquinas, he needs to give a real reason why a premise should be thrown out. Now in the end, and to his credit, Mr. Woodford proposes a brief objection to the third premise, despite his impulse to ignore it, but in doing so he continues to exhibit his poor understanding of the argument. He lays out the following counterexample. If, for example, a steel rod that's heated on one end counts as an object, then objects can actualize or change themselves, because if the rod was left alone, the hot end would warm up the cold end. Hence, this is a false premise. Now, leaving aside the fact that Woodford is objecting to what he identified as the second premise earlier in the video, his objection is so sophomoric it's almost laughable. One can say the rod changes itself, but only insofar as the actually hot end changes the potentially hot end. So in other words, one part of the steel rod is actually hot, and it changes the other end, which is potentially hot, to actually hot. And so, yet again, something that's potential, the cold part of the rod, is brought to actuality only by something that's actual, the hot part of the rod. A distinction that completely removes the force of Mr. Woodford's objection. So Mr. Woodford comes to Aquinas' final premise, and he has the following problem with it. Yes. If we don't want an infinite regress, it seems, given what we know, that we must assume an unactualized actualizer, or a first cause, or an unmoved mover, or a non-contingent contingency. But that's definitely not sufficient reason to conclude that there is one. In fact, that's simply an argument by assertion. Did Mr. Woodford just assert that this is an argument from assertion? Mr. Woodford is simply failing to appreciate that this is a summary of the argument. It is called a summa, after all. Mr. Woodford asserts logical fallacies all over his videos. Should we put the same objection against his logical fallacy thumbnails? Of course not. He assumes, as any reasonable person would, that his viewers are aware that they can find a full account of these fallacies elsewhere if they were so inclined. And so I'm happy to grant that the absurdity of an infinite series of movers is not proven in any of Woodford's quotes from Aquinas, Fazer, or Shapiro. But that's not the same thing as saying that they have no argument for this premise at all. Aquinas and Phaser, and probably Shapiro too, are well aware that this premise is proven in the study of metaphysics, which, as discussed above, Aquinas assumes his reader has already mastered. So before dismissing it as a baseless assertion, maybe Mr. Woodford should study those arguments with some open-mindedness. And Woodford's specious accusation. And in Ben's case, it's also an appeal to emotion. If you don't want an infinite, infinite regress of causes, you have to come to the unactualized actualizer. This is simply ridiculous. Look at what Woodford said earlier. We can't honestly assert that everything adheres to the principle of causation, lest we want to commit a black swan fallacy. Are we to accuse Woodford of the same flawed reasoning? Of course not. This is just a manner of speaking, and Shapiro's case ought to be heard with the same charity and fair-mindedness. These attempts to shore up his position with 
all possible objections, no matter how trivial or ridiculous, they succeed only in exposing Woodford's desperation. Now, in fairness, Woodford does mention that Aquinas argues for this premise, but sadly, instead of addressing Aquinas' argument, Woodford just rejects it. Now, unlike Ben and Phaser, Aquinas does provide an argument, that being that if the deterministic chain were to go on forever, there would be no first mover and consequently no other mover, but this simply doesn't stand to reason, and this is primarily because it's based on outdated and flawed Aristotelian physics. He doesn't explain how or why this is so, he just goes on to talk about why he doesn't see a need to posit a first mover, or why causes and effects couldn't go on forever. If there is no first mover, which is to say, if cause and effect is infinite, we have an answer that accurately accounts for our observations, and, most critically, one that doesn't require us to make an unfounded assumption that violates everything we know. Again, he didn't address any argument that there can't be an infinite hierarchical series of move movers. He tries to bolster his position, saying, Given all the evidence we have for movers absolutely requiring a mover, do we have sufficient reason to believe that there's a mover that doesn't require a mover? No. The evidence indicates that everything is contingent on something, and this is further bolstered by the fact that the law of conservation of energy has never been violated. Now this rebuttal is ironic for two reasons. First, he makes no attempt to address the hierarchical temporal sequence distinction. There's no reason, for example, in theory, why a series of dominoes couldn't go on forever, but if you see a light in the mirror, and it's reflected off another mirror, I don't care how many mirrors you have, but there has to be a light source somewhere. Such a distinction is the true basis of the premise. And second, when he dismisses an unmoved mover by pointing out all the evidence we've observed and the law of conservation of energy has never been violated, therefore there's no unmoved mover, this sounds eerily similar to the definition of black swan fallacy he gave earlier in his video. Talk about the philosopher calling the swan black. And finally, as if this will help his position, he proposes this absurd notion. Instead of thinking of a ladder-like chain of events, think of a long circular chain of events, one in which every cog is turned by another cog, and hence there being no need for a cog that turns itself. Now, no one is proposing a cog that moves itself, or anything analogous to that. Again, Phasers and Aquinas' claim is not that you have a self-moving mover, but an unmoved mover. Philosophically, he might as well argue that someone could be their father's father's father. And his allusion to the Big Bang controversy? I mean, what about the Big Bang? Doesn't that prove an absolute beginning? The answer is definitely no. A complete red herring. An unmoved mover is not the same thing as a beginning of time. And in fact, Aquinas and Aristotle clearly taught that you could not know from reason alone that the universe had a beginning. So they're right in line with Mr. Woodford there. So while a demonstration for the absurdity of an infinite series of moved movers may still be sought, and it's a fair question, None of Woodford's arguments are enough to prove that this premise is false. In fact, they all suggest a naive or incomplete understanding of the premise. Then comes the nail in the coffin for Mr. Woodford. That even if this argument was valid and sound, even if it proved the existence of an unmoved mover or an unactualized actualizer, that's literally all it would prove. To which I say, fair enough. But the arguments in question 2, article 3 of the Summa, are not trying to prove that the unmoved mover is one and so on. Those come later. So why is that a problem? Ever a beacon of objectivity. There's one concession Mr. Woodford is willing to throw Thomas's way, but not without reservation. Now, to his credit, Aquinas didn't propose that this argument proves the existence of his very specific Christian God. For that, he offered additional flawed arguments. Given Mr. Woodford's proclivity for misapprehending premises and committing the very fallacies of which he accuses his opponents, this is a bold claim coming from him. If he does attempt to tackle these flawed arguments in subsequent videos, I will hear what he has to say with much anticipation, but very little apprehension. Now, Mr. Woodford says he cares about what's true, and I'd like to think that he's sincere in that sentiment, but it's so hard to reconcile that with his willingness to dismiss the arguments of one of the most influential minds of the past 1,000 years with such frivolous objections, to say nothing of the injustice done to his viewers who may walk away from his videos thinking they understand Aquinas when they really don't. Sharp guy, though he obviously is, Mr. Woodford is not debunking Aquinas at all. He's contending with a caricature. Every one of his points indicate a failure to take Aquinas' proof seriously, or the thought and tradition behind them. One can only speculate whether this springs from cursory readings of pre-selected portions of the Summa on his own, or poorly trained teachers who convinced him that such shallow analyses of Aquinas were acceptable, a grave disservice to Woodford as well as Aquinas. 
Does Woodford really think that he's pointing out fallacies that no one's ever noticed until now? Has he ever considered the possibility that the problems he sees are not with the premises themselves, but with his own incomplete understanding of them? His channel is called Rationality Rules, and certainly in seeking the truth, rationality is essential. But if you want to make any progress in learning and seeking wisdom, you need some humility too. Every student has to take some things on the word of his teacher in the beginning, and only comes to see them for himself later on. Otherwise, you may wake up one day and find yourself as the guy Socrates talks about, the one who fancies he knows something, although he knows nothing. And as a teacher, Mr. Woodford is doing his viewers and Patreons no service, either in knowing what's true or how to find it, and trying to persuade them to dismiss Aquinas with such flippancy. As a fellow lover of truth, I urge Mr. Woodford, if you've not studied Aquinas seriously, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. I'm Jake Whalen. This has been The Higher Grounds. Thanks for watching.